the thing that carries the rhythm of life, that gets your blood circulating, that extends life, is when we're able to master the contraction and expansion cycle. Uh, and that contraction of the heart, that squeezing of the chest, is what invites the expansion. Um, the contraction of the heart is like when the coal turns into a diamond and becomes luminous, something that's quite opaque and dark. You hold it up to the one light and it shows off the many, many colors. Um, then the expansion, that's joy. Welcome to the Sufi Heart Podcast with Omid Safi, featuring teachings and stories from the wisdom of the Islamic tradition. Omid invites you to a meditation on the transformative power of love and recalling the necessity of healing our own hearts through healing the world. If you'd like to support Omid's podcast, please visit BeHereNowNetwork.com forward slash Omid. Hello, friends. Uh, this is Omid, and I'd like to welcome you back to the Sufi Heart podcast. We had uh, taken a little bit of a break as I was tending to myself and to my family and um, the beautiful community of friends that we have from Illuminated Courses and the tours, some of the programs in Turkey and Morocco and uh, Mecca and Medina. And uh, a lot of the friends kept reminding me of just how important and dear these podcasts are for you and for them. And uh, so I'm happy to announce that we are coming back and um, have recorded a few programs that I'm going to be sharing with you over the course of the next few weeks. And uh, the program that we have today is a really delightful one. Uh, one of the teachers that I especially love and admire and look up to is Sharon Salzberg, uh, my wonderful Buddhist uh, teacher and friend. And uh, Sharon and I have shared a friendship for many years. We used to write columns together for On Being some years ago. And um, we did a retreat together out in California, which was such a joy. And she's just one of those people that I like being around. And she has such a beautiful combination of lived wisdom uh, that is practical in the best sense of that word. It is meant to be practiced. It's intended to be put into practice. And uh, Sharon has organized uh, a summit, a gathering of different spiritual teachers, and it's called Living an Authentic Life. What a beautiful aspiration that is. And there's a whole um, group of teachers and uh, representatives of different spiritual traditions who had been invited. And I was fortunate enough to be one of them. So the gathering that um, was part of this summit is the subject of our podcast for today. So I was asked to reflect on what does living an authentic life look like in the Islamic tradition, highlighting the wisdom of the Sufi tradition, and one of the themes in particular that I was asked to speak about was the idea of expansion. What does expansion look like for our spirits, for our heart, for our lives? And that's the subject of this conversation that I was delighted to have as part of the summit. So I invite you to join us. And if you like what you hear, 
please feel free to check out uh, the online teachings and offerings that we have through illuminatedcourses.com. Thank you again for being with us as part of the Sufi Heart Podcast. Welcome back to the summit. My name is Andres Gonzalez of the Holistic Light Foundation, and I'm here today with a beloved Iranian-American scholar and author, Dr. Omid Safi, who is one of the world's leading intellectuals within the field of contemporary Islamic thought and spirituality. Omid is a teacher in the Islamic tradition of radical love. He serves as a professor at Duke University, specializing in Islamic spirituality and contemporary thought. A leading Muslim public intellectual, Omid is committed to the intersection of spirituality and social justice and is deeply committed to liberation in the legacy of Martin Luther King, Rabbi Heschel, and Malcolm X. Omid has published extensively on the foundational sources of Islam and Sufism. His Memories of Muhammad is a biography of the Prophet Muhammad, and his most recent book is Radical Love, Teachings from the Islamic Mystical Tradition. He has a podcast called Sufi Heart at Be Here Now, and he's the founder of Illuminated Courses and Tours. It's a, it's a pleasure. It really is a pleasure to have you here today, Omid. Um, how are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing quite well. I'm really grateful for this time and for this conversation. Uh, yeah, I'm, ex- I'm super excited. This is, uh, you know, uh, I'm very excited to hear your wisdom and learn from you and to share some space. Um, you, you've become known as someone who combines history and literature, storytelling, anthropology, contemporary mystical studies to offer wisdom and life lessons that can help connect us deeper to our inner selves and inspire us to practice radical love and compassion. So let's begin with some background on your pathway to the work you do now. How did you become interested in using your expertise in contemporary Islamic spirituality and social social justice to improve our world? Well, um, I was, uh, I've been really blessed in my life to have uh, entered this world through a family uh, that's characterized by love. I've been loved into my bones, as I like to say, by my parents, by teachers. Um, and uh, I come from an Iranian background where many of these spiritual teachings, mystical poetry, is just the air that we breathe. Um, and, and growing up, it was also not all uh, smooth sailing. And so when I was about nine years old, um, the country of my ancestors, Iran, went through a very turbulent revolution. And it was a revolution that had a lot of idealistic themes and motifs. Uh, we really thought that we were going to build a just egalitarian society. And, and in many ways, that dream uh, turned into a nightmare for a lot of people. Um, but in some ways, I think those two wings, I love these metaphors of a bird that has two wings, and these two wings have to soar together. They have to be harmonized. Um, that, that metaphor really works for me. And uh, I like to think of the two wings in some ways as being the dimension of love and the dimension of justice. And neither one of them by itself is sufficient. If, um, if you tie down the wing of a bird, it probably can't fly very well. And I think it's that same way for, for us is um, the quest for living a spiritually luminous life, a beautiful life, a life that is perfumed by the mysteries of what it means to be human and connected to the divine. Um, That's beautiful and necessary and at the very core of what makes us human. And yet, if it turns purely into an individual quest that is unconcerned with the welfare and the welfare well-being of other fellow human beings and other sentient beings then ironically that same path of spirituality can turn into a kind of narcissism 
And likewise, um, you know, we are concerned with the welfare, well-being, well-doing of our fellow human beings, our fellow sentient beings. Um, but it's not just some grand Marxist exercise of redistributing resources. Uh, we, we care because we love. And we love because we see in each other, in the human, something of God, something of the sacred. And uh, those two dimensions, the love dimension and the justice dimension, have always been there for me, I think, since I was a kid, because of this upbringing that I've had, where one minute my parents are quoting Rumi poetry and Hafiz poetry, and then the next minute I'm looking at millions of people demonstrating on the street to, demonstrate, to create um, this hopefully just an egalitarian society. Uh, that's left a deep imprint on my soul. And a lot of the work of the last 40 years or so of my life has been trying to learn how to balance these two wings. Wow, that was so beautifully said. And uh, I mean, uh, and I know we're just meeting for the first time, um, but love is such a huge part of, of the work that, that we do. And my teacher used to always you know, say, just love is the most powerful force in the universe. It's that uniting force that's going to connect all of us. So people joke and call me and my business partners love zombies because we're just trying to infect people with love and spread this love. So to hear that, and then I'm a Libra too, so you're talking about justice. And uh, I think one of the only things in this world that gets me a little frustrated or uh, you know, I try not to connect with anger much, but you know, I get a little angry is when I see injustice. So I love that concept of the bird, those two wings of love and justice. And it really, it really resonates with me. It was so beautifully said. And, and man, I wish I had parents that were, <laughs> they were saying poetry to me at my age. I, I had to wait till after college to hear a lot of Rumi and, so uh, what a blessing your, your, your upbringing was. It's really amazing to hear. Um, it is. It's, a, it's an undeserved um, gift. And, and um, the, the only thing, the only response to beauty is beauty, as the Quran says. Mm -hmm. And um, so all I can try to do is to pay it forward and to share some of that love with my children, with my neighbors, with the strangers, with, um, with the world, really. Um, and, and I hope at some point during our conversation, we'll get to circle back to, uh, to anger, because I do actually think it has a place. Um, if, if, you, if you see um, innocent people, you know, suffering and being bombed and driven off of their homeland and beaten by the police, and if your only response is, you know, well, I'm sure this is all okay in some grand cosmic sense, you know, well, then, then I'm not sure how advanced we really have become spiritually. There is a place for, um, I sometimes like to make a distinction between rage and outrage. Uh, mm -hmm. There is a place for outrage. And sometimes in a lot of what we see around us in the world, it's outrageous. And to be outraged by it doesn't mean that we're somehow not spiritually evolved. It actually just means that you still have a heart. It means that you have a heart that knows that there is a better way, there is a higher path, that the way that things are is not the way that they should be. Uh, the question is always about how. How do we experience that outrage? How do we express it? How can we channel it somehow to be the fuel? for a kind of efficacious transformation. And I do see and I do pay attention to what a lot of my fellow sisters and brothers are teaching us. And so I know, um, for example, in the black womanist tradition, there's been a lot of reminder about even rage, even anger has a place. And you would, be, you would be angry too if it was your sons who day after day after day were being killed and shot at and humiliated by the police. Um, 
So we got a lot to learn from one another and with one another. And I think a lot of what I'm hoping to do is to end up with a more robust and expansive sense of love. It's to rescue love from Hallmark. Um, as, as I like to tell people, love is not an emoji. Uh, you don't text love to people. Uh, love is a verb, and God is a verb. Uh, you do love. And to, it's really to end up with this much more um, vital, vibrant, luminous, active sense of love where we're not generating it. We're kind of getting out of this nonsense of today I love you, tomorrow I may not. Um, it's kind of wishy-washy. And it's really love as this cosmic force that brings us to existence, sustains us here. And if we can just get over ourselves for a minute or two, get over our ego uh, and merge into this cosmic river of love, then it can carry us back to our divine origin. So beautiful. Uh, teacher would always call it righteous anger. Yeah. Say it. You know, and, and I love the river too. You'd always tell me, he would call it an ocean love. And he says, Andy, you can either dip your toe in it. He's like, you can take a cup of it. He's like, or you can just dive your entire body into it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's, there's, a, there's a reason why so many of these mystics love an ocean metaphor. And, you know, um, both two of the great mystics of Islam, Rumi and Ibn Arabi, they sometimes describe God as an ocean without shore. It's an ocean that's limitless, boundless. Uh, yeah. There's no beach to this ocean. Um, and so this sense of stop being an edge dweller, stop being uh, a beach bum. And, and go, go into that ocean of God um, and, and know that you're not going to drown because you were born with gills and you might not have used them in a few decades, but you're intended to swim. You're, you're, you came from the ocean. You're meant for the ocean. Um, and, you know, Rumi's uh, teacher, Shams, at one point uh, he says, um, he was reflecting back on his own childhood, and he says, I love my parents. They were very sweet people, and they loved me as best as they could, but they were not people of mystery. They were not people of God. And all my life, they kept telling me that you're a chicken, and you're meant for the land, but I knew that I was meant for the sea. And he said, and then one day, I got to the sea, and I dove right in, and I figured out that I'm a duck, not a chicken. <laughs> And, you know, it's a very earthy, beautiful, simple kind of story, but it's also the story of a lot of us who uh, keep being told that we are this and we're only this and we should play it safe. And then at some point in life, you, you dive in and you figure out, lo and behold, that you're actually a creature of the ocean, of the ocean of God, and you're meant to be with the ocean. Um, and that's, that's your home. Um, I think, you know, there's lots of different spiritual experiences, and, and I'm not uh, here to tell anybody how they should experience them. For some people, it is a kind of awakening, and they want something perhaps exotic and completely different than what they have seen in their life before. And for other people, it is that deep sense of coming home but that coming home to a home that they didn't know existed. Mm -hmm. uh, it, is, it is confirming and affirming everything that in their deepest, most inner heart, they've always held to be true, even when they didn't have the words for it. Awesome. Well, so... I could talk to you about love the entire time here, but I want to make sure 
<laughs> I get to some of these other questions that I have here. And uh, the theme for the day is expansion and how expansion can enhance, you know, lived experience and how the common good can benefit from us harnessing such energy in transformative ways. So mm. the question I have is, is, what does expansion mean to you? Like, when do you feel most expansive and how do you work to enhance this in your day-to-day -day life? Yeah. Um, you know, it's very interesting. In, the, um, in our tradition, uh, there are these two wings. <laughs> There's that metaphor again, uh, that we use to sometimes talk about different experiences that we have. And one of them is expansion. And the other one is contraction. Mm. And we use them again in tandem. Uh, it is like this, you notice we keep coming back to the same metaphors. It's like a wave of an ocean that now washes on the shore and then now recedes back to the ocean. Um, and I see expansion and contraction as the same dynamic. Um, so in the Quran, uh, God uses the language of the expansion of the heart and the contraction of the heart. And these are both necessary, and they're necessary for us to experience, and they're necessary for us to live into. Um, and the contraction that's like when you feel that squeezing of your heart, that dark night of the soul, um, and it hurts, <laughs> and it's a there's a there's a pain and there's a suffering, and it's a reminder that the life of this world includes pain. Um, we come into this world through our mama's pain. And the Sufis, what do they say? When you came into this world, um, the person closest to you was crying, uh, and then they, um, and then they laugh. And so you want to live your life that when you've completed the journey, you are laughing, and everybody else around you uh, is crying for that gate of heaven being closed. Um, and both the laughter and the and the the tears are are a part of this this journey. Um, that contraction of the heart, if you just look at that contraction and expansion of the heart, if your heart was just expanding and expanding and expanding, well, it would burst. The thing that carries the rhythm of life that gets your blood circulating that extends life is when we're able to master the contraction and expansion cycle. Uh, and that contraction of the heart, that squeezing of the chest, is what invites the expansion. Um, the contraction of the heart is like when the coal turns into a diamond and becomes luminous, something that's quite opaque and dark. You hold it up to the one light and it shows off the many, many colors. Um, then the expansion, that's joy. That's your heart getting bigger. Um, and these days, I'm thinking a lot about the metaphors of birth and pregnancy and raising of children, because I'm a baba, I'm a father. And these metaphors, thank you, um, they're, they're with me a lot these days. Um, and there's something about that expansion of the heart, which, um, you know, I experienced the first time that I had uh, a kid, I have a baby girl who's now 22 years old. And she's a great love of my life. I love her as fully as I can possibly love any other human. And she knows it too. Um, and then when I had my second kid, I was actually terrified. Because my worry was, what do I have left to give to this other kid? I've already loved my first baby as much as I possibly can. 
<laughs> and, and I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll take my heart and I'll cut it in half and I'll give half to this new baby and half to the <laughs> old baby. Uh, and something really miraculous happened, which is that when my second child was born and I looked at him, I loved him every bit, instantly, immediately, as much as I love my first daughter. Um, and so I love my son, Amir, as much as I love my daughter, Roya, and my daughter, Leila, and my daughter, Aya, and so on. Um, and what I figured out is that when my son was born, and he's now 20, I didn't love him half as much, but my heart expanded. It got bigger, and my capacity to love grew. Right? This is something I love when Sharon says, what if we looked at love as a power, as a faculty that can grow? Uh, love is not just a feeling. It's not. Love is something that we can exercise and we can grow into. I think being uh, a parent of multiple children, I've had a little bit of a sense of that expansion of the heart, that your heart can grow to encompass more beings. I think part of being a spiritually alive human being is that that expansion, which always is combined with contraction, it never stops. So Jesus tells us that you have to learn to love thy neighbor as thyself. And if you hate yourself, then it's really hard to love a neighbor. Mm -hmm. so there is that need to also shower yourself with love, to also love and accept and embrace the totality of, of you. But you don't want it to stop there. You want to expand. You want to include your family. You want to include the neighbor. You want to include the ones that look like you and pray like you, but you don't want to stop there. You want to keep expanding to include the ones that don't look like you, and don't pray like you, and carry a different color passport have very different languages and customs until no one and no thing is left outside that circle of love. Um, so I think that's part of the goal of, of expansion, is on one hand to see the rhythm of contraction and expansion so that when hardship comes in life, when your heart aches and breaks, you also see that as part of the spiritual path. It's not just the unspiritual part of life. Um, I'm very suspicious of any spiritual tradition that can only talk about success. Uh, I think that, that sounds like used car salesman to me. Um, yeah. And so contraction and expansion and then expansion beyond yourself, beyond your family, beyond your quote unquote community, until you realize that our community is that of being, is that of creation, that of manifestation. Um, and as we are, we're in this together, and we um, link our breath and our existence and our light with other people. You mentioned a little about the heart and about the heart breaking. And, um, there's a, a conversation on compassion in 2019 where you're talking about a, a Rumi quote or a poem, I think it was, and it was something along the lines of every heart breaks, but not every heart breaks open. And you said there's a difference between a heart that merely breaks and a heart that breaks open. Uh, you know, can you, can you speak to that a little more? Yeah, so you know, Rumi has this um, exquisite masterpiece called the Masnavi. Um, it's a book of some, you know, thirty thousand lines of poetry. It's like story after story after story, but the book opens with him praying for a heart that is broken open, um, and that's such an instructive point. That for a lot of us, our hearts are shut off and we're closed. Um, you know, he's got this beautiful poem that love manifests itself to him in this, the form of this beautiful woman. And, uh, and he starts talking to it. 
And the first thing that he says is, uh, oh, you again. Um, I'm afraid of something else because I've tried you before and I got hurt real bad before. Uh, I'm afraid of something else. Man as cheese digar me tarsam. I'm afraid of something else. And love answers, honey, there is nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm all there is. Um, and you know, in a, in a in a different context, in a different language, in a theological language, we would say God is all there is. But since ultimately the essence of God is love, love is not just a quality of God, love is divine. Yes. Um, love is all there is. And in that sense, Rumi comes back and he, so he prays for his heart to be opened, broken open. Um, and again here, you know, all of these kinds of metaphors deserve and call for a kind of wisdom. Um, what you don't want to do is you don't want to take your precious heart, which is really the throne of God, and just keep shattering it on every rock. Uh, if something is precious, you want to hold it, you want to cherish it, you want to honor it. So yeah, the shell of the heart, this is what Rabbi Heschel, uh, that wonderful Jewish mystic, was close friend of Dr. King's, he talks about breaking the callousness of the heart. It's this thing that we think is protecting our heart, but it's actually shutting you off from connecting with other people. That callousness has to be broken. It even has to be shattered. But, you know, I'm a teacher and I especially teach young people. Um, college kids most of the time. And so to actually tell them sometimes, be careful with your heart. Um, be careful with the tenderness of your heart. Don't just put your heart on a platter and, and offer it to every person who may or may not know what to do with it. Um, so we need to have wisdom in knowing what to do with these kinds of stories. Yes, every heart has to break and not every heart that is broken breaks open. But we want a heart that opens up, opens up towards God, opens up towards mystery, opens up towards all, opens up towards our fellow human beings, and opens up towards that ultimate mystery of what we are. And what an awesome encounter that is. And what a terrifying encounter that is to see the light of our own being, to know that you're not just this fleshy, lumpy, dumpy creature. Uh, like you are the breath of God, the light of God, wrapped inside dust that came from the furthest galaxies. You are a cosmic being wrapped up inside celestial stuff. That's what it is to be human. Um, and we have got every means of tantalizing us, of distracting us, of occupying our time, killing time, as people say. Um, but, you know, this tradition says, no, every moment, every breath is a precious jewel. And so we want to cherish every breath like a sacred jewel. Mm. So I, I, I really love this conversation. I'm going to ask you for a book list of recommendations after we talk, but we'll go to that later. Um, uh, I want to go back to the beginning again in terms of your spiritual journey, because I'm curious, like, what does that look like over time? You mentioned a bunch of people already, you know, in terms of the, being spiritual teachers or people that have inspired or influenced you. But you know, you know can you can you talk more to that about you know, kind of what got you here? You, know, you, you, you touched on it briefly with you know, how you were raised. And like I said, you can mention some of these teachers, but like, what got you? And who do you think has inspired or, inspired or influenced you the most? 
So, you know, these, um, these Sufis are very mischievous um, beings. And so sometimes when you ask them a question like that, uh, here's how they answer you. Um, they say, so God was, and there was nothing with God, and it is now as it was then. Um, and God, to use a saying of the Prophet Muhammad, God was a hidden treasure, and God loved to be known. God desired to be known. Uh, so he brought into being existence so it could be like a mirror to reflect him. And then they just stop and they look at you. And you're like, I was asking you about you. And they're like, I am telling you about, <laughs> what I'm telling you is that the you that you think I am really doesn't exist. Mm. Um, and you keep wanting me to tell you a biography. Uh, and, and I can do that. I can play that game too. And I can tell you, I read this book. Mm. Uh, and yeah, there have been books. And I met this teacher. And yeah, there have been teachers. Um, but it's not so much a book list that we need. There are sacred books. Yes, I do recommend the Quran and Rumi and Hazrat Anayat Khan and Ibn Arabi and others. Um, I recommend reading about the life of the Prophet Muhammad, the being of the Prophet Muhammad. But the book list is a rainbow. The book list is a sunset. The book list is to remember the giggle of your child. Uh, the book list is the embrace of your mama. Uh, the book list is that child or that cat who is pulled out from under the rubbles in Turkey and Syria. That's the book list. That's, those are the times that we remember that we were meant for something much greater than this, that we are something much greater than this. Um, and then if what we want is, you know, that biography, that being who was born in 1970 and at some point will take his last breath and that his body will go back to the soil, the same celestial soil that it came from and the spirit goes back to that same place. Yes, that, that being, this fleshy, beautiful spirit having a celestial embodied experience. There have been teachers of mine, like my parents, teachers of mine, like everybody who's ever loved on me, um, like Pir Zia, the grandson of Hazrat Anayat Khan, um, like Rumi, um, and, and really the light of the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, that, th these are my teachers. And um, we, we have a saying that God is the light. God is the light of the heavens and the earth. And anybody that ever touches your life, anybody that ever teaches you something, they are a reflection of that light, of that one light. And all the prophets, all the messengers, all the sages, all the illuminated beings, um, they are shining that Nur Muhammad, that light of the prophet, that light spirit of guidance uh, towards humanity. Uh, um, it's beautiful. It's just my, my brain is, is going through so many concepts here, and I, you know, I'm thinking about how in my journey, how I, it took a while to to realize that that infinite, that, that I'm omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent. That everyone is a reflection of that light. It's in all of us. We are God. We are one. You know, how do you keep an open heart in that sense of curiosity of well-being for the world during these times, right? You know, like, how do you stay grounded in love in this world that so desperately needs that justice we are talking about and that transformation? There, there's something, um, I, I remember the little boy that I was when I was six years old. Um, 
and I have a little picture of him, um, and I keep him very close to my heart. Um, I'm not six years old in the body anymore, but something of that six-year-old boy um, I keep close to me. And I remember the open-eyed sense of wonder and amazement with which he experienced life. Um, I remember how he laughed. And it was a big hearted laugh, like big bellied laugh, his belly moving up and down, his shoulders going up and down, sometimes laughing so hard that like tears would be coming from. <laughs> that. And, and, you know, I sometimes look at the way that grown ups laugh, mm. supposedly grown ups. Um, and <laughs> here's the strange thing when you see grown ups laugh, half the times they do this. Yeah, like they're trying to hide it, cover it up. They hide their own joy and part of me just wants to be like who did this to you uh who 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 taught you to be ashamed of your own joy that it's not even somebody else covering up your joy you yourself have to cover up your own joy um and that's a reminder for me of like not just be true to yourself which we hear that in a lot of spiritual paths be true to that child within you because that child is very close to God. That child is very true to his or her divine origin. Um, and all of us who in some ways are on the path, yes, we want to touch other people's lives. Yes, we want to touch their hearts. Maybe we want to be a teacher. Maybe we want to be a conduit. And in some ways, we live in a very interesting age. Um, I'm sure that when we're done with this conversation, that some of it is going to be put online. And maybe somebody sitting in one corner of the world can click on a button and hear a snip of it, snip of it, snippet of it on Instagram or on some website or whatever. That's kind of cool. That's kind of yeah. neat. Right? It's pretty awesome. They got their feet up on a couch somewhere and they hit a button and here comes the voice of Sharon or somebody else and sharing some teaching with them. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And we also need to have the wisdom of knowing how to process that. And one of the challenges that we have is that everybody and their grandmother, maybe myself included, wants to be a teacher. Um, and the Sufis always say, it's, it's uh, everybody's in a rush to be a teacher. No one wants to be a student. Mm. No one wants to do the hard work that it takes to actually be uh, a student. So yes, we want to be conduits. Yes, we want to touch lives and transform lives. Let's not skip the part where we're first transformed. And if and when we're willing to do that work, to go through the process of transformation, then whatever comes from you is transformed. And that transformation, to go back to that contraction that's linked to expansion, that's sometimes a little bit like taking the coal and turning it into a diamond. Um, that's a little bit like taking a larva and letting it go into a cocoon before it becomes a butterfly. And I read somewhere that in the cocoon, everything is actually melting. Like there's a dissolving away of the thing that used to be the larva before it can become the butterfly, the moth. Um, these are all beautiful metaphors for us. And I think whenever in life, I've had an experience of being around these beautiful sages, these beautiful teachers. Um, it does seem effortless. The giving seems quite effortless because their being has actually been transformed. But I know that it took a lot of effort to get to the effortless. It took a lot of work 
to get to the point that it looks like it's all workless. Um, and I think that's the part that I want to make sure we don't bypass. We don't bypass our own transformation. Um, and, you know, the, the ego, ourselves, our souls, are in need of this transformation. Um, not to be dissolved away, but to be illuminated. And that's a messy process. And it requires care and guidance and love. Lots and lots of love and guidance and wisdom. Okay. So, unfortunately, we're coming to a close on our conversation here. And uh, before we finish up, I was wondering if you would like to share a quick little practice with our listeners. Yeah. Uh, I'd be happy to, and this is a um, a practice that um, my friend uh, Pierzia uh, of the Inaiti Order uh, teaches us. And um, so, what I just invite people to do is to find some place to get comfortable. Um, the basis of this is quite similar to what you find in so many other traditions. Um, just simply start by having your feet on the ground and sense your feet touching the ground. Perhaps if you're sitting on a chair, be mindful of where your thighs are touching the chair, where your bottom is sitting on the chair, your back is leaning on the chair. And the practice is simply a practice of the breath. And it is to Pay attention to the breath. The whole mystery of the path is connected to the breath. And it's not about retaining the breath. It's not about holding the breath. It's simply about observing. Observing the breath that enters your chest, expands it, and then flows out. So it is really that theme of what we've been talking about, the expansion and the contraction. And we're going to begin with a contraction. We're going to begin by letting the air out of your lungs, as much of it as you can exhale. You're going to let it go. You're going to release it, release it, release it. And when you've released all the air, then watch the air that comes rushing back to fill that opening that you've created. To that extent, the breathing out, the exhalation, it's not just an emptiness. It's not just a nothingness. It's creating an invitation and an opening for the breath, for God to come rushing in. So let's take about five to 10 cycles of exhale, 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 and then watch the breath come back in. And we'll do this for five to 10 cycles, beginning with the exhalation. last time. Mm -hmm. 
We're going to do the same practice five more cycles of the breath, except this time, when the breath is entering your chest, see if you notice the beating of your heart. And your heart is always beating, but sometimes it's easy for us to neglect it, to forget about it. And uh, we are told in, in the Quran that God is closer to you than the beating of your heart. So here's that friend that's always with you. Here's that divine presence neglected most of the time that's always within you. So let's do that five more times. Exhale, exhale, exhale. And then the inhale. And sense that beating of the heart. For the last cycle of the five breaths, the exhalation and the inhalation, when you experience that beating of the heart, sometimes you might notice that it starts out just beating within your chest. Then you can experience that pulsation, that beating, extending to your arms, extending to the tips of your fingers, that your being is actually a vibration, a pulse. And that that breath that you're releasing, it continues. It might roll through the room that you're sitting, out the window, over the hills, mingling with the trees, breathed in by every butterfly, every bird, that our breath mingles. That we breathe with the trees, with the birds, and we in return take in their breath, that we're linked in together. You're never alone. That the reason that going for a walk in the woods, sitting by an ocean, brings you joy, it's not because you're going into nature. It's because you yourself are nature, and nature delights in nature. So in this last cycle of breathing, we remember connection. We remember our relationship with the stars and the planets and the birds, with every blade of grass, and everyone with whom this breath mingles. We'll do this and finish with five cycles of the breath. When you're ready, return to your senses, open your eyes, 
see the place that you've been sitting. And this practice is one that one can revisit at any time of the day. It's a beautiful practice to do in the mornings to get yourself settled for the day. Um, and as one grows deeper in the practice, there are mantric phrases, liquors that are added to it. Um, this particular one is the breath of the earth, the earth breath. Um, and there's also water and fire and air and ether breaths. But the earth breath is, is the beginning one, and it's a very useful, beautiful practice that anybody uh, from any background can, can begin with. Beautiful. <clears throat> Thank you so, so much for sharing with us today. I, I really have appreciated this conversation, sitting with you and sharing space. And all our listeners, don't forget to learn more about Omid. You can visit his website, www.illuminatedcourses.com. Um, and don't forget to check out that book, right? Uh, hope everyone has a blessed and beautiful day. Thank you so much. <laughs> Kuş bir gün bir